Chapter Sixteen of Jill the Reckless by P. G. Woodhouse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Mr. Goble plays with fate. One. On the boardwalk at Atlantic City, that much enduring seaside resort which has been the birthplace of so many musical plays, there stands an all-day and all-night restaurant, under the same management and offering the same hospitality as the one in Columbus Circle, at which Jill had taken her first meal on arriving in New York. At least its hospitality is noisy during the waking and working hours of the day but there are moments when it has an almost cloistral peace and the customer abashed by the cold calm of its snowy marble and the silent gravity of the white robed attendants unconsciously lowers his voice and tries to keep his feet from shuffling like one in a temple the members of the chorus of the rose of america dropping in by ones and twos at six o'clock in the morning about two weeks after the events recorded in the last chapter spoke in whispers and gave their orders for breakfast in a subdued undertone the dress rehearsal had just dragged its weary length to a close it is the custom of the dwellers in atlantic city who seem to live entirely by pleasure to attend a species of vaudeville performances incorrectly termed a sacred concert on sunday nights and it had been one o'clock in the morning before the concert scenery could be moved out of the theatre and the first act set of the rose of america moved in and as by some unwritten law of the drama no dress rehearsal can begin without a delay of at least an hour and a half the curtain had not gone up on mr miller's opening chorus until half past two there had been dress parades, conferences, interminable arguments between the stage director and a mysterious man in shirt-sleeves about the lights, more dress parades, further conferences, hitches with regard to the sets, and another outbreak of debate on the subject of blues, ambers, and the management of the spot, which was worked by a plaintive voice answering to the name of Charlie at the back of the family circle but by six o'clock a complete if ragged performance had been given and the chorus who had partaken of no nourishment since dinner on the previous night had limped off round the corner for a bite of breakfast before going to bed they were a battered and a draggled company some with dark circles beneath their eyes others blooming with the unnatural scarlet of the make-up which they had been too tired to take off the duchess haughty to the last had fallen asleep with her head on the table the red-headed babe was lying back in her chair staring at the ceiling the southern girl blinked like an owl at the morning sunshine out on the boardwalk the cherub whose triumphant youth had brought her almost fresh through a sleepless night contributed the only remark made during the interval of waiting for the meal the fascination of stage life why girls leave home she looked at her reflection in the little mirror of her vanity bag it is a face she murmured reflectively but i should hate to have to go around with it long a sallow young man with the alertness peculiar to those who work on the night shifts of restaurants dumped her tray down on the table with a clatter the duchess woke up babe took her eyes off the ceiling the southern girl ceased to look at the sunshine already at the mere sight of food the extraordinary recuperative powers of the theatrical worker had begun to assert themselves in five minutes these girls would be feeling completely restored and fit for anything conversation broke out with the first sip of coffee and the calm of the restaurant was shattered its day had begun it's a great life if you don't weaken said the cherub hungrily attacking her omelette and the worst is yet to come i suppose all you old dears realize that this show will have to be rewritten from end to end and we'll be rehearsing day and night all the time we're on the road why lois denham spoke with her mouth full what's wrong with it the duchess took a sip of coffee don't make me laugh she pleaded what's wrong with it what's right with it one would feel more inclined to ask one would feel still more inclined said the cherub to ask why one was such a chump as to let oneself in for this sort of thing when one hears on all sides that waitresses earn sixty dollars a month the numbers are all right argued babe i don't mean the melodies but johnny has arranged some good business he always does said the southern girl 
some more buckwheat cakes please but what about the book i never listened to the book the cherub laughed you're too good to yourself i listen to it right along and take it from me it's sad of course they'll have it fixed we can't open in new york like this my professional reputation wouldn't stand it didn't you see wally mason in front making notes they've got him down to do the rewriting jill who had been listening in a dazed way to the conversation fighting against the waves of sleep which flooded over her woke up was wally was mr mason there sure sitting at the back jill could not have said whether she was glad or sorry she had not seen wally since that afternoon when they had lunched together at the cosmopolis and the rush of the final weeks of rehearsals had given her little opportunity for thinking of him at the back of her mind had been the feeling that sooner or later she would have to think of him but for two weeks she had been too tired and too busy to re-examine him as a factor in her life there had been times when the thought of him had been like the sunshine on a winter day warming her with almost an impersonal glow in moments of depression and then some sharp poignant memory of derrick would come to blot him out she came out of her thoughts to find that the talk had taken another turn and the worst of it is the cherub was saying we shall rehearse all day and give a show every night and work ourselves to the bone and then when they're good and ready they'll fire one of us that's right agreed the southern girl they couldn't jill cried you wait said the cherub they'll never open in new york with thirteen girls mike's much too superstitious but they wouldn't do a thing like that after we've all worked so hard there was a general burst of sardonic laughter jill's opinion of the chivalry of theatrical managers seemed to be higher than that of her more experienced colleagues they'll do anything the cherub assured her you don't know the half of it dearie scoffed lois denham you don't know the half of it wait till you've been in as many shows as i have said babe shaking her red locks the usual thing is to keep a girl slaving her head off all through the road tour and then fire her before the new york opening but it's a shame it isn't fair if one is expecting to be treated fairly said the duchess with a prolonged yawn one should not go into the show business and having uttered this profoundly true maxim she fell asleep again the slumber of the duchess was the signal for a general move her somnolence was catching the restorative effects of the meal were beginning to wear off there was a call for a chorus rehearsal at four o'clock and it seemed the wise move to go to bed and get some sleep while there was time the duchess was roused from her dreams by means of a piece of ice from one of the tumblers bills were paid and the company poured out yawning and chattering into the sunlight of the empty sidewalk jill detached herself from the group and made her way to a seat facing the sea tiredness had fallen upon her like a leaden weight crushing all the power out of her limbs and the thought of walking to the boarding-house where from motives of economy she was sharing a room with the cherub paralyzed her it was a perfect morning clear and cloudless with the warm freshness of a day that means to be hotter later on the sea sparkled in the sun little waves broke lazily on the gray sand jill closed her eyes for the brightness of the sun and water was trying and her thoughts went back to what the cherub had said if wally was really going to rewrite the play they would be thrown together she would be obliged to meet him and she was not sure that she was ready to meet him still he would be somebody to talk to on subjects other than the one eternal topic of the theatre somebody who belonged to the old life she had ceased to regard freddy rook in this light for freddy solemn with his new responsibilities as a principal was the most whole-hearted devotee of shop in the company freddy nowadays declined to consider any subject for conversation that did not have to do with the rose of america in general and his share of it in particular jill had given him up and he had paired off with nelly bryant the two were inseparable jill had taken one or two meals with them but freddy's professional monologues of which nelly seemed never to weary were too much for her as a result she was now very much alone there were girls in the company whom she liked but most of them had their own intimate friends and she was always conscious of not being really wanted she was lonely and after examining the matter as clearly as her tired mind would allow she found herself curiously soothed by the thought that wally would be near to mitigate her loneliness she opened her eyes blinking sleep had crept upon her with an insidious suddenness and she had almost fallen over on the seat she was just bracing herself to get up 
and begin the long tramp to the boarding-house when a voice spoke at her side. "'Hullo! Good morning!' Jill looked up. "'Hullo, Wally!' "'Surprised to see me?' "'No. Millie Trevor said she had seen you at the rehearsal last night.' Wally came round the bench and seated himself at her side. His eyes were tired and his chin dark and bristly. "'Had breakfast?' "'Yes, thanks. Have you?' "'Not yet. How are you feeling?' "'Rather tired.' "'I wonder you're not dead. I've been through a good many dress rehearsals, and this one was the record. Why they couldn't have had it comfortably in New York, and just have run through the piece without scenery last night, I don't know, except that in musical comedy it's etiquette always to do the most inconvenient thing. They know perfectly well that there was no chance of getting the scenery into the theatre till the small hours. You must be worn out. Why aren't you in bed?' "'I couldn't face the walk. I suppose I ought to be going, though.' She half rose, then sank back again. The glitter of the water hypnotized her. She closed her eyes again. She could hear Wally speaking. Then his voice grew suddenly faint and far off, and she ceased to fight the delicious drowsiness. Jill awoke with a start. She opened her eyes and shut them again at once. The sun was very strong now. It was one of those prematurely warm days of early spring which have all the languorous heat of late summer. She opened her eyes once more and found that she was feeling greatly refreshed. She also discovered that her head was resting on Wally's shoulder. "'Have I been asleep?' Wally laughed. "'You have been having what you might call a nap.' He massaged his left arm vigorously. "'You needed it. Do you feel more rested now?' "'Good gracious! Have I been squashing your poor arm all the time? Why didn't you move?' "'I was afraid you would fall over. You just shut your eyes and toppled sideways.' "'What's the time?' Wally looked at his watch. "'Just on ten? Ten? Jill was horrified. "'Why, I have been giving you a cramp for about three hours. You must have had an awful time.' "'Oh, it was all right. I think I dozed off myself. Except that the birds didn't come and cover us with leaves, it was rather like babes in the wood.' "'But you haven't had any breakfast. Aren't you starving?' "'Well, I'm not saying I wouldn't spear a fried egg with some vim if it happened to float past.' But there's plenty of time for that. Lots of doctors say you oughtn't to eat breakfast, and Indian fakers go without food for days at a time in order to develop their souls. Shall I take you back to wherever you're staying? You ought to get a proper sleep in bed. Don't dream of taking me. Go off and have something to eat. Oh, that can wait. I'd like to see you safely home. Jill was conscious of a renewed sense of his comfortingness. There was no doubt about it. Wally was different from any other man she had known. She suddenly felt guilty as if she were obtaining something valuable under false pretenses. "'Wally?' "'Hullo.' "'You—you you oughtn't to be so good to me.' "'Nonsense. Where's the harm in lending a hand, or rather an arm, to a pal in trouble?' "'You know what I mean. I can't—that is to say, it isn't as though I—I I mean—' Wally smiled a tired, friendly smile. "'If you're trying to say what I think you're trying to say, don't. We had all that out two weeks ago.' I quite understand the position. You mustn't worry yourself about it. He took her arm, and they crossed the boardwalk. Are we going in the right direction? You lead the way. I know exactly how you feel. We're old friends, and nothing more. But as an old friend, I claim the right to behave like an old friend. If an old friend can't behave like an old friend, how can an old friend behave? And now we'll rule the whole topic out of the conversation. But perhaps you're too tired for conversation? Oh, no. Then I will tell you about the sad death of Mr. Pilkington. What? Well, when I say death, I use the word in a loose sense. The human giraffe still breathes, and I imagine from the speed with which he legged it back to his hotel when we parted that he still takes nourishment. But really he is dead. His heart is broken. We had a conference after the dress rehearsal, and our friend Mr. Goble told him in no uncertain words— in the whole course of my experience I have never heard words less uncertain that his damned rotten highbrow false alarm of a show, I am quoting Mr. Goble, would have to be rewritten by alien hands. And these are them. On the right alien, right hand. On the left alien, left hand. Yes, I am the instrument selected for the murder of Pilkington's artistic aspirations. I am going to rewrite the show. In fact, I have already rewritten the first act and most of the second. Goble foresaw this contingency and told me to get busy two weeks ago, and I've been working hard ever since. We shall start rehearsing the new version tomorrow and open Baltimore next Monday with practically a different piece. And it's going to be a pippin, believe me, said our hero modestly. 
a gang of composers has been working in shifts for two weeks and by chucking out nearly all of the original music we shall have a good score it means a lot of work for you i'm afraid all the business of the numbers will have to be rearranged i like work said jill but i'm sorry for mr pilkington he's all right he owns seventy per cent of the show he may make a fortune he's certain to make a comfortable sum that is if he doesn't sell out his interest in peak or dudgeon if you prefer it from what he said at the close of the proceedings i fancy he would sell out to anybody who asked him at least he said that he washed his hands of the piece he is going back to new york this afternoon won't even wait for the opening of course i am sorry for the poor chap in a way but he had no right with the excellent central idea which he got to turn out such a rotten book oh by the way yes another tragedy unavoidable but pathetic poor old freddie he's out oh no out repeated wally firmly but didn't you think he was good last night he was awful but that isn't why goble wanted his part rewritten as a scotchman so as to get mcandrew the fellow who made such a hit last season in hootsman that sort of thing is always happening in musical comedy you have to fit parts to suit whatever good people happen to be available at the moment my heart bleeds for freddy but what can one do at any rate he isn't so badly off as a fellow was in one of my shows in the second act he was supposed to have escaped from an asylum and the management in a passion for realism insisted that he should shave his head the day after he shaved it they heard that a superior comedian was disengaged and fired him it's a ruthless business the girls were saying that one of us would be dismissed oh i shouldn't think that's likely i hope not so do i what are we stopping for jill had halted in front of a shabby-looking house one of those depressed buildings which spring up overnight at seashore resorts and start to decay the moment the builders have left them i live here here wally looked at her in consternation but jill smiled we working girls have got to economize besides it's quite comfortable fairly comfortable inside and it's only for a week she yawned i believe i'm falling asleep again i'd better hurry in and go to bed good-bye wally dear you've been wonderful mind you go and get a good breakfast two when jill arrived at the theatre at four o'clock for the chorus rehearsal the expected blow had not fallen no steps had apparently been taken to eliminate the thirteenth girl whose presence in the cast preyed on mr goble's superstitious mind but she found her colleagues still in a condition of pessimistic foreboding wait was the gloomy watchword of the rose of america chorus the rehearsal passed off without event it lasted until six o'clock when jill the cherub and two or three of the other girls went up to snatch a hasty dinner before returning to the theatre to make up it was not a cheerful meal reaction had set in after the overexertion of the previous night and it was too early for first-night excitement to take its place everybody even the cherub whose spirits seldom failed her was depressed and the idea of an overhanging doom had grown it seemed now to be merely a question of speculating on the victim and the conversation gave jill as the last addition to the company and so the cause of swelling the ranks of the chorus to be the unlucky number a feeling of guilt she was glad when it was time to go back to the theatre the moment she and her companions entered the dressing-room it was made clear to them that the doom had fallen in a chair in the corner all her pretense and affection swept away in a flood of tears sat the unhappy duchess the centre of a group of girls anxious to console but limited in their ideas of consolation to an occasional pat on the back and an offer of a fresh pocket-handkerchief it's tough honey someone was saying as jill came in somebody else said it was fierce and a third girl declared it to be the limit a fourth girl well-meaning but less helpful than she would have liked to be was advising the victim not to worry the story of the disaster was brief and easily told the duchess sailing in at the stage door had paused at the letter-box to see if cuthbert her faithful auto salesman had sent her a good luck telegram he had but his good wishes were unfortunately neutralized by the fact that the very next letter in the box was one from the management crisp and to the point informing the duchess that her services would not be required that night or thereafter it was the subtle meanness of the blow that roused the indignation of the rose of america chorus the cunning villainy with which it had been timed 
Poor May, if she'd opened tonight, they'd have had to give her two weeks' notice or her salary, but they can fire her without a cent just because she's only been rehearsing and hasn't given a show. The Duchess burst into a fresh flood of tears. "'Don't you worry, honey,' advised the well-meaning girl, who would have been in her element looking in on Job with Bildad and Shuhite and his friends. "'Don't you worry.' "'It's tough,' said the girl, who had adopted that form of verbal consolation. "'It's fierce,' said the girl, who preferred that adjective. The other girl, with an air of saying something new, repeated her statement that it was the limit. The Duchess cried forlornly throughout. She had needed this engagement badly. Chorus salaries are not stupendous, but it is possible to save money by means of them during a New York run, especially if you have spent three years in a milliner's shop and can make your own clothes, as the Duchess, in spite of her air of being turned out by Fifth Avenue modistes, could and did. She had been looking forward now, as this absurd piece was to be rewritten by somebody who knew his business and had a good chance of success, to putting by just those few dollars that make all the difference when you are embarking on married life. Cuthbert, for all his faithfulness, could not hold up the financial end of the establishment unsupported for at least another eighteen months, and this disaster meant that the wedding would have to be postponed again. So the Duchess, abandoning that aristocratic manner criticized by some of her colleagues as upstage and by others as ritzy, sat in her chair and consumed pocket-handkerchiefs as fast as they were offered to her. Jill had been the only girl in the room who had spoken no word of consolation. This was not because she was not sorry for the Duchess. She had never been sorrier for any one in her life. The pathos of that swift descent from haughtiness to misery had bitten deep into her sensitive heart, but she revolted at the idea of echoing the banal words of others. Words were no good, she thought, as she set her little teeth and glared at an absent management, a management just about now presumably distending itself with a luxurious dinner at one of the big hotels. Deeds were what she demanded. All her life she had been a girl of impulsive action, and she wanted to act impulsively now. She was in much the same berserk mood as had swept her raging to the defense of Bill the Parrot on the occasion of his dispute with Henry of London. The fighting spirit which had been drained from her by the all-night rehearsal had come back in full measure. "'What are you going to do?' she cried. "'Aren't you going to do something?' "'Do? The members of the Rose of America ensemble looked doubtfully at one another. Do? It had not occurred to them that there was anything to be done. These things happened, and you regretted them, but as for doing anything, well, what could you do?' Jill's face was white, and her eyes were flaming. She dominated the roomful of girls like a little Napoleon. The change in her startled them. Hitherto they had always looked on her as rather an unusually quiet girl. She had always made herself unobtrusively pleasant to them all. They all liked her. They had never suspected her of possessing this militant quality. Nobody spoke, but there was a general stir. She had flung a new idea broadcast, and it was beginning to take root. Do something! Well, if it came to that, why not? We ought all to refuse to go on tonight unless they let her go on, Jill declared. The stir became a movement. Enthusiasm is catching in every girl as a heart a rebel, and the idea was appealing to the imagination. Refuse to give a show on the opening night. Had a chorus ever done such a thing? They trembled on the verge of making history. Strike? quavered somebody at the back. Yes, strike, cried Jill. "'Hooray! That's the thuff! shouted the cherub, and turned the scale. She was a popular girl, and her adherence to the cause confirmed the doubters. "'Strike! Strike! Strike!' Jill turned to the Duchess, who had been gaping amazedly at the demonstration. She no longer wept, but she seemed in a dream. "'Dress and get ready to go on!' Jill commanded. "'We'll all dress and get ready to go on. Then I'll go and find Mr. Goble and tell him what we mean to do. And if he doesn't give in, we'll stay here in this room, and there won't be a performance.' Three, Mr. Goble, with a derby hat on the back of his head and an unlighted cigar in the corner of his mouth, was superintending the erection of the first act set when Jill found him. He was standing with his back to the safety curtain, glowering at a blue canvas, supposed to represent one of those picturesque summer skies, which you get at the best places on Long Island. Jill, coming downstage from the staircase that led to the dressing-room, interrupted his line of vision. 
"'Get out of the light!' bellowed Mr. Goble, always a man of direct speech, adding, "'Damn you!' for good measure. "'Please move to one side,' interpreted the stage director. "'Mr. Goble is looking at the set.' The head carpenter, who completed the little group, said nothing. Stage carpenters always say nothing. Long association with fussy directors has taught them that the only policy to pursue on opening night is to withdraw into silence, wrap themselves up in it, and not emerge until the enemy has grown tired and gone off to worry somebody else. "'It don't look right,' said Mr. Goble, cocking his head on one side. "'I see what you mean, Mr. Goble,' assented the stage director obsequiously. "'It has perhaps a little too much, er, not quite enough. Yes, I see what you mean.' "'It's too damn blue,' rasped Mr. Goble, impatient of the vacillating criticism. "'That's what's the matter with it.' The head carpenter abandoned the silent policy of a lifetime. He felt impelled to utter. He was a man who, when not at the theatre, spent most of his time in bed reading all fiction magazines. But it so happened that once, last summer, he had actually seen the sky, and he considered that this entitled him to speak almost as a specialist on the subject. "'The sky is blue,' he observed huskily. "'Yes, sir, I seen it.' He passed into the silence again, and to prevent a further lapse, stopped up his mouth with a piece of chewing gum. Mr. Goble regarded the silver-tongued orator wrathfully. He was not accustomed to chatterboxes arguing with him like this. He would probably have said something momentous and crushing, but at this point Jill intervened. "'Mr. Goble,' the manager swung round to her, "'what is it?' It is sad to think how swiftly affection can change to dislike in this world. Two weeks before, Mr. Goble had looked on Jill with favor. She had seemed good in his eyes. But that refusal of hers to lunch with him, followed by a refusal some days later to take a bit of supper somewhere, had altered his views on feminine charm. If it had been left to him, as most things were about this theatre, to decide which of the thirteen girls should be dismissed, he would undoubtedly have selected Jill. But at this stage in the proceedings there was the unfortunate necessity of making concessions to the temperamental Johnson Miller. Mr. Goble was aware that the dance director's services would be badly needed in the rearrangement of the numbers during the coming week or so, and he knew that there were a dozen managers waiting eagerly to welcome him if he threw up his present job. So he had been obliged to approach him in quite a humble spirit and inquire which of his female chorus would be most easily spared and as the duchess had a habit of carrying her haughty languor onto the stage and employing it as a substitute for the chorea which was mr miller's ideal the dance director had chosen her to mr goble's dislike of jill therefore was added now something of the fury of the baffled potentate jawant he demanded mr goble is extremely busy said the stage director extremely a momentary doubt as to the best way of approaching her subject had troubled Jill on her way downstairs, but now that she was on the battlefield confronting the enemy she found herself cool, collected, and full of a cold rage which steeled her nerves without confusing her mind. "'I came to ask you to let Maid Arcy go on to-night.' "'Who the hell's Maid Arcy?' Mr. Goble broke off to bellow at a scene-shifter who was depositing the wall of Mrs. Stuyvesant Van Dyke's Long Island residence too far down stage. "'Not there, you fool! Higher up!' "'You gave her notice this evening,' said Jill. "'Well, what about it?' "'We want you to withdraw it.' "'Who's we?' "'The other girls and myself.' Mr. Goble jerked his head so violently that the derby hat flew off, to be picked up, dusted, and restored by the stage director. "'Oh, so you don't like it. Well, you know what you can do?' "'Yes,' said Jill, "'we do. We are going to strike.' "'What?' If you don't let May go on, we shan't go on. There won't be a performance tonight unless you like to give one without a chorus. Are you crazy? Perhaps, but we're quite unanimous. Mr. Goble, like most theatrical managers, was not good at words over two syllables. You're what? We've talked it over, and we've all decided to do what I said. Mr. Goble's hat shot off again and gambled all the way into the wings, with the stage director bounding after it like a retriever. "'Whose idea is this?' demanded Mr. Goble. His eyes were a little foggy, for his brain was adjusting itself but slowly to the novel situation. "'Mine?' "'Oh, yours. I thought as much.' "'Well,' said Jill, "'I'll go back and tell them that you will not do what we ask. We shall keep our make-up on in case you change your mind.' She turned away. "'Come back!' Jill proceeded toward the staircase. As she went, a husky voice spoke in her ear. "'Go to it, kid. You're all right.' The head carpenter had broken his trappist bows twice in a single evening, a thing which had not happened to him since the night three years ago, 
when sinking wearily into a seat in a dark corner for a bit of rest he found that one of his assistants had placed a pot of red paint there four to mr goble fermenting and full of strange oaths entered johnson miller the dance director was always edgy on first nights and during the foregoing conversation had been flitting about the stage like a white-haired moth his deafness had kept him in complete ignorance that there was anything untoward afoot and he now approached mr goble with his watch in his hand eight twenty five he observed time those girls were on stage mr goble glad of a concrete target for his wrath cursed him in about two hundred and fifty rich and well-selected words huh said miller hand to ear mr goble repeated the last hundred and eleven words the pick of the bunch can't hear said mr miller regretfully got a cold the grave danger that mr goble a thick-necked man would undergo some sort of a stroke was averted by the presence of mind of the stage director who returning with the hat presented it like a bouquet to his employer then his hands being now unoccupied formed them into a funnel through his flesh and blood megaphone endeavored to impart the bad news the girls say they won't go on mr miller nodded i said it was time they were on they're on strike it's not said mr miller austerely what they like it's what they're paid for they ought to be on stage we should be ringing up in two minutes the stage director drew another breath then thought the better of it he had a wife and children and if dada went under with apoplexy what became of the home civilization's most sacred product he relaxed the muscles of his diaphragm and reached for pencil and paper mr miller inspected the message felt for his spectacle case found it opened it took out his glasses replaced the spectacle case felt for his handkerchief polished the glasses replaced the handkerchief put the glasses on and read a blank look came into his face why he inquired the stage director with a nod of the head intended to imply that he must be patient and all would come right in the future recovered the paper and scribbled another sentence mr miller perused it because may darcy has got her notice he queried mazed but the girl can't dance a step the stage director by means of a wave of the hand a lifting of both eyebrows and a wrinkling of the nose replied that the situation unreasonable as it might appear to the thinking man was as he had stated and must be faced what he inquired through the medium of a clever drooping of the mouth and a shrug of the shoulders was to be done about it mr miller remained for a moment in meditation i'll go talk to them he said he flitted off and the stage director leaned back against the asbestos curtain he was exhausted and his throat was in agony but nevertheless he was conscious of a feeling of quiet happiness his life had been lived in the shadow of the constant fear that some day mr goble might dismiss him should that disaster occur he felt there was always a future for him in the movies scarcely had mr miller disappeared on his peacemaking errand when there was a noise like a fowl going through a quick-set hedge and mr salzburg brandishing his baton as if he were conducting an unseen orchestra plunged through the scenery at the left upper entrance and charged excitedly down the stage having taken his musicians twice through the overture he had for ten minutes been sitting in silence waiting for the curtain to go up at last his emotional nature cracking under the strain of this suspense he had left his conductor's chair and plunged down under the stage by way of the musician's bolt hole to ascertain what was causing the delay what is it what is it what is it inquired mr salzburg i wait and wait and wait and wait we cannot play the overture again what is it what has happened mr goble that overwrought soul had betaken himself to the wings where he was striding up and down with his hands behind his back chewing his cigar the stage director braced himself once more to the task of explanation the girls have struck mr salzburg blinked through his glasses the girls he repeated blankly oh damn it cried the stage director his patience at last giving way you know what a girl is don't you they have what struck walked out on us refused to go on mr salzburg reeled under the blow but it is impossible who is to sing the opening chorus in the presence of one to whom he could relieve his mind without fear of consequences the stage director became savagely jocular that's all arranged he said we're going to dress the carpenters in skirts the audience won't notice anything wrong should i speak to mr goble queried mr salzburg doubtfully yes if you don't value your life returned the stage director mr salzburg pondered 
I will go and speak to the children, he said. I will talk to them. They know me. I will make them be reasonable. He bustled off in the direction taken by Mr. Miller, his coat-tails flying behind him. The stage director, with a tired sigh, turned to face Wally, who had come in through the iron pass door from the auditorium. Hello, said Wally cheerfully. Going strong? How's everybody at home? Fine. So am I. By the way, am I wrong, or did I hear something about a theatrical entertainment of some sort here tonight? He looked about him at the empty stage. In the wings on the prompt side could be discerned the flannel-clad forms of the gentlemanly members of the male ensemble, all dressed up for Mrs. Stuyvesant Van Dyke's tennis party. One or two of the principals were standing perplexedly in the lower entrance. The O.P. side had been given over by general consent to Mr. Goble for his perambulations. Every now and then he would flash into view through an opening in the scenery. "'I understand that tonight was the night for the great revival of comic opera. Where are the comics, and why aren't they opping?' The stage director repeated his formula once more. "'The girls have struck.' "'So have the clocks,' said Wally. "'It's past nine. The chorus refused to go on.' no really just artistic loathing of the rotten piece or is there some other reason they're sore because one of them has been given her notice and they say they won't give a show unless she's taken back they've struck that mariner girl started it she did wally's interest became keener she would he said approvingly she's a heroine little devil i never liked that girl now there said wally is just the point on which we differ i have always liked her and i've known her all my life so shipmate if you have any derogatory remarks to make about miss mariner keep them where they belong there he prodded the other sharply in the stomach he was smiling pleasantly but the stage director catching his eye decided that his advice was good and should be followed it was just as bad for the home if the head of the family gets his neck broken as if he succumbs to apoplexy you surely aren't on their side he said me said wally of course i am i'm always on the side of the downtrodden and oppressed if you know of a dirtier trick than firing a girl just before the opening so that they won't have to pay her two weeks salary mention it till you do i'll go on believing that it is the limit of course i'm on the girl's side i'll make them a speech if they want me to or head the procession with a banner if they are going to parade down the boardwalk i'm for em father abraham a hundred thousand strong and then a few if you want my considered opinion your old friend goble has asked for it and got it and i'm glad 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 if you don't mind my quoting pollyanna for a moment i hope it chokes him you'd better not let him hear you talking like that au contraire as we say in the gay city i'm going to make a point of letting him hear me talk like that adjust the impression that i fear any goble in shining armor because i don't i propose to speak my mind to him i would beard him in his lair if he had a beard well i'll clean shave him in his lair that will be just as good but hist whom do we have here tell me do you see the same thing i see like the vanguard of a defeated army mr salzburg was coming dejectedly across the stage well said the stage director they would not listen to me said mr salzburg brokenly the more i talked the more they did not listen he winced at a painful memory miss trevor stole my baton and then they all lined up and sang the star-spangled banner not the words cried wally incredulously don't tell me they knew the words mr miller is still up there arguing with them but it will be of no use what shall we do asked mr salzburg helplessly we ought to have rung up half an hour ago what shall we do we must go and talk to goble said wally something has got to be settled quick when i left the audience was getting so impatient that i thought he was going to walk out on us he's one of those nasty determined-looking men so come along Mr. Goble, intercepted as he was about to turn for another walk up stage, eyed the deputation sourly and put the same question that the stage director had put to Mr. Salzburg. Well? Wally came briskly to the point. You'll have to give in, he said, or else go and make a speech to the audience, the burden of which will be that they can have their money back by applying to the box office. These Jones of Ark have got you by the short hairs. I won't give in then give out said wally or pay out if you prefer it trot along and tell the audience that the four dollars fifty in the house will be refunded mr goble gnawed his cigar i've been in the show business fifteen years i know and this sort of thing has never happened to you before one gets new experiences mr goble cocked his cigar at a fierce angle and glared at wally something told him that wally's sympathies were not wholly with him they can't do this sort of thing to me he growled 
"'Well, they are doing it to someone, aren't they?' said Wally. "'And if it's not you, who is it?' "'I've a damn good mind to fire them all.' "'A corking idea. I can't see a single thing wrong with it, except that it would hang up the production for another five weeks and lose you your bookings, and cost you a week's rent of this theatre for nothing, and mean having all the dresses made over, and lead to all your principals going off and getting other jobs. These trifling things apart we may call the suggestion a bright one.' "'You talk too damn much,' said Mr. Goble, eyeing him with distaste. "'Well, go on. You say something. Something sensible.' "'It is a very serious situation,' began the stage director. "'Oh, shut up,' said Mr. Goble. The stage director subsided into his collar. "'I cannot play the overture again,' protested Mr. Salzberg. "'I cannot.' At this point Mr. Miller appeared. He was glad to see Mr. Goble. He had been looking for him, for he had news to impart. "'The girls,' said Mr. Miller, "'have struck. They won't go on.' Mr. Goble, with the despairing gesture of one who realizes the impotence of words, dashed off for his favorite walk up stage. Wally took out his watch. Six seconds and a bit, he said approvingly, as the manager returned. A very good performance. I should like to time you over the course in running kit. The interval for a reflection, brief as it had been, had apparently enabled Mr. Goble to come to a decision. Go, he said to the stage director, and tell him that fool of a Darcy girl can play. We've got to get that curtain up. Yes, Mr. Goble, the stage director galloped off. "'Get back to your place,' said the manager to Mr. Salzberg, "'and play the overture again.' "'Again.' "'Perhaps they didn't hear it the first two times,' said Wally. Mr. Goble watched Mr. Salzberg out of sight. Then he turned to Wally. "'That damn Mariner girl was at the bottom of this. She started the whole thing. She told me so. Well, I'll settle her. She goes tomorrow.' "'Wait a minute,' said Wally. "'Wait one minute. Bright as it is, that idea is out.' "'What the devil has it got to do with you?' Only this, that if you fire Miss Mariner, I take that neat script which I prepared and I tear it into a thousand fragments, or nine hundred, anyway. I tear it. Miss Mariner opens in New York, or I pack up my work and leave. Mr. Goble's green eyes glowed. Oh, you're stuck on her, are you? he sneered. I see. Listen, dear heart, said Wally, gripping the manager's arm. I can see that you are on the verge of introducing personalities into this very pleasant little chat. Resist the impulse. Why not let your spine stay where it is instead of having it kicked up through your hat? Keep to the main issue. Does Miss Mariner open in New York, or does she not? There was a tense silence. Mr. Goble permitted himself a swift review of his position. He would have liked to do many things to Wally, beginning with ordering him out of the theatre, but prudence restrained him. He wanted Wally's work. He needed Wally in his business, and in the theatre business takes precedence of personal feelings. All right, he growled reluctantly. "'That's a promise,' said Wally. "'I'll see that you keep it.' He looked over his shoulder. The stage was filled with gaily colored dresses. The mutineers had returned to duty. "'Well, I'll be getting along. I'm rather sorry we agreed to keep clear of personalities, because I should have liked to say that, if ever they have a skunk show at Madison Square Garden, you ought to enter and win the blue ribbon. Still, of course, under our agreement, my lips are sealed, and I can't even hint at it. Goodbye. See you later, I suppose.' Mr. Goble, giving a creditable imitation of a living statue, was plucked from his thoughts by a hand upon his arm. It was Mr. Miller, whose unfortunate ailment had prevented him from keeping abreast of the conversation. "'What did he say?' inquired Mr. Miller, interested. "'I didn't hear what he said.' Mr. Goble made no effort to inform him. End of chapter 16 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com dot com